The gut microbiome. Research is finally catching up to the importance of it, yet we are so far away with understanding how important the gut microbiome is, Martha. One of the things I want to ask you is how important is the gut microbiome as it relates to metabolic health? Well, what I would say is the gut microbiome is the primary driver of our metabolic health. And shifts in the gut microbiome can have a tremendous impact on our metabolism. And we see that evidence now. I actually was just reading a paper on nutritional interventions in people with long COVID. About a third of people, they're saying now, um, are, sh are showing shifts in their metabolic health after having had COVID or the vaccine, either one. And um, a big part of that metabolic shift is uh, related to insulin sensitivity and what's going on in the microbiome with insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So COVID actually um, kills bifidobacteria, either COVID or the vaccine, that spike protein kills bifidobacteria. And that's one of the really most important organisms that we have that our babies are losing um, from lack of breastfeeding and the whole Western diet. And C-section um, as well. And C-section as well. Um, it used to be that babies were colonized by this bifido infantis. And when they were breastfed, they would get single colonies of this one bacteria. And it would train the whole immune system and their metabolic health. Wow. And over time, Western population has lost this organism. There's actually a company called Avivo that came out of UC Davis that did all this global research on infant microbiome and found this missing organism um, to try to help put back into babies. But also, for us as adults, bifidobacteria produces something called plasmologens, and those are really important for the brain and brain health, and they're starting to show a lot of research connecting plasmologens um, in Alzheimer's and you know, potentially giving plasmologen supplements as a, you know, a possible um, help for people with Alzheimer's. So that loss of the bifidobacteria is really, really critical. And, and of course, you know, bifidobacteria is um, a, you know, one of the common things you find in probiotics. Right. Um, but, you know, our focus, well, I mean, let me just back up. Nine years ago, I heard about the microbiome from reading Dr. Martin Blazer's book, Missing Microbes. And he was talking about the rise of the use of antibiotics widely in medicine. It's sort of given out like candy, but it's also widely used in um, animal health. And it was used in animal health uh, to get the animals fatter. So if we think back then to microbiome and metabolic health, of course, that, met that metabolic shift in the animals could make them fatter faster. So the same thing's happening in us. Wow. You know, you use those antibiotics and it kills certain bacteria that are maintaining that metabolic homeostasis and other bacteria that allow the faster loading of fats and proteins. And so, you know, that was kind of a big aha for me reading his book that drove me to found the Bio Collective. So, and it's hard for me to believe it's been nine years, but, you know, we started studying people's poop. And you can see in these patterns of all these different diseases, common things in metabolic health that are a problem. And, you know, one of those is how we handle sugars in the gut and sugars and what, what bacteria they feed and how that changes the gut. Uh, you know, Richard Johnson's done a lot of work with um, fructose. Yeah. Um, but it's also a question I get from people who've been on a ketogenic diet for a long time and are still struggling with um, insulin sensitivity issues. Yeah. And that's another piece of the puzzle that people don't understand well is that actually 
when we're under stress, we produce fructose in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So you could be on a ketogenic diet trying to manage your glucose, but if you're under a tremendous amount of stress, which more and more people are um, these days, you're producing fructose in your body. So I get people ask me that question because, you know, we have the sugar shift formula and our study was in diabetics and the changes um, that we could see in a, in a, insulin changes in insulin sensitivity in the whole metabolic health profile but you know people who are on a ketogenic diet say well you know do i still need to take a probiotic like that and you know one thing yes because of the stress we're all under but the other thing too is glyphosate which i know we're going to talk about in a minute but you know glyphosate is an antibiotic and so again back to that martin blazer work you're killing lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, these key organisms um, that come from the fermented food world. Um, and those have historically been our drivers of maintaining metabolic homeostasis. And, you know, with the rise of antibiotics and the rise of glyphosate, we're losing these really important organisms that help us balance our metabolic health. Wow. Okay. So Bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, those are two of the most common bacteria we see in many probiotics out there. Antibiotics deplete that. You just made the case that these, uh, I'll say, safe and effective choices deplete that. And the toxic proteins that come from the safe and effective choices or just getting COVID in general. What about the person who's watching and listening and they're, they're saying, well, I never got the safe and effective choice. I was pretty good with COVID and I handle it well and I don't take antibiotics. You said something else that was interesting that the food that we eat, the animals that were injected or that were given antibiotics when they are slaughtered and then we consume them, it's also like taking an antibiotic as well that also wipes out bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. Am I, am I saying that correctly? You are saying that correctly. And on top of that, you know, we have this misconception that all the, quote, fresh packaged foods in the grocery store are healthy for us. Uh, but if you if you just kind of take a step back for a moment, okay, in our digestive tract, food should break down into the nu nutrient components that we need to absorb. But in a grocery store, in order to preserve shelf life, a lot of different chemicals, ingredients, antibiotic type things are used to keep the food from browning, to keep it from breaking down. To So I, I use um, hummus as an example, um, which, you know, keto people probably aren't eating anyway. But, <laughs> um, you know, if you, you buy a tub of hummus, you know, people think, oh, this is really healthy. But that's like a giant Petri dish. So to keep bacteria from growing on the top of it, you know, they're putting antibiotic materials in as food preservatives. So there's all these different food preservatives that are used in, quote, small amounts um, to keep the food from rotting and maintaining a longer shelf life at the grocery store. But if you're eating those, you're actually putting something in your body that's preventing the breakdown of what you need to do to access um, the nutritional content of the food. So that's why I'm always telling people it's it's much, much better to, even though it takes a little more time, to, you know, cut up your vegetables yourself, to make your food fresh. You know, people want to grab that package of shredded carrots or, you know, diced onions and peppers to make their dinner simple. You know, it's only going to take you two or three more minutes to actually cut that up yourself, and then you're not going to have those uh, preservatives going into your gut, killing your gut bacteria and stopping the breakdown of the food. I'd even think about that as another source. Is there a certain um, thing listed in the ingredients list that we should be aware of with those preservatives? Most of the time, they're not really? listed on the package because they're, quote, such a small amount. Or, um, But one in particular that I've been uh, looking at recently is uh, something called a tyrosinase inhibitor. And that's actually used to prevent browning. And they've actually engineered the Arctic apple. If you've heard of this apple, it's an apple that won't brown. So, you know, when you cut an apple slice, it browns. Yeah, well, they want to be able to put these apples in kids' prepackaged 
prepackaged lunches. And so they um, engineered an apple that doesn't have that enzyme. Well, that's an actual, that's a very important enzyme in the human body. And so, you know, we, we tinker around with things with this very reductionist approach to science without looking at the whole complex system and how these little pieces play play out in our complex ecosystem that's maintaining our health. Food science is wicked. It really, I mean, they're very brilliant, these scientists, but they're messing with Mother Nature. They're yeah. messing with the natural <laughs> processes, and it doesn't take into effect the complex human body, especially the gut microbiome. I would say uh, human beings are the only species smart enough to create their own food and dumb enough to actually eat it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You mentioned glyphosate. I want to I want to dive into this. This is a really important part of the conversation here. We were just talking offline, Martha. When we look at Europe, we look at Italy, for example. You know, I'm looking at the life expectancy of people in Italy, for example. Uh, it's around 78 years, I, I believe, 78, 79 here in the U.S., uh, it's a lot less, 71, 72, I believe, somewhere around there. Don't quote me on and those. And falling. Specific. Yeah, and falling, exactly. So there's a huge difference in life expectancy here in the United States versus Italy, for example, but other countries in Europe. And the obesity rates are a fraction uh, in Europe, Italy, as they are here in the United States, which is getting close to 50%. According to Harvard, in 2030, it will be about 50%. And even the rates of diabetes and different Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, different condi conditions out there, they have a lot less of that. And it's not that they have more gyms in Italy. They have a fraction of the gym, so they're not exercising more. So what is it about Italy? What is it about Europe that makes them so much healthier than us here in the United States? And for me, and I think for you too, all signs point to, to glyphosate, which they banned, Italy did in 2016. So talk a little bit more about what I just said and the problem with glyphosate. So it's interesting because glyphosate is actually something that I started looking into almost 20 years ago. Wow. Um, when my husband, John, was first diagnosed with Parkinson's. And he had been drinking soy protein shakes um, for about two years prior to that. And soy is one of the crops that um, has a lot of glyphosate corn and soy and then those go into many many ingredients because and, and animal feed as well and animal feed as well and so i've sort of followed the pathway of digging into and understanding the mechanisms of glyphosate and glyphosate is actually patented as an antibiotic um in conjunction, it has to be combined with something, and right now it's escaping me what it's combined, but what it's combined with is common in our diet. And um, it, it actually kills more of the beneficial bacteria like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria that we talked about and, and doesn't kill pathogenic bacteria. So, you know, that's not a great thing. And then it's depleting the soil microbiome that is critical for the nutrient uptake in the body. Um, but originally it was kind of sold as, okay, it targets something called the shikimate pathway that humans don't have. Uh, but it just so happens that bacteria do have the shikimate pathway. And we are more bacterial than we are human, which may or may not have been known at that time, um, but the shikimate pathway, actually, I have a book at home on all the enzymes of the shikimate pathway, and it's it must be, you know, four or 500 pages. Wow. And so you think of all these critical enzymes that are downstream of this pathway that you are attacking in the microorganisms, and it's pretty shocking. Um, how all, all of these different pieces of the puzzle. And so that was actually one of the drivers I was looking at relative to a potential impact in Parkinson's. And there's, um, there's actually a paper from back in, um, I think it's from 2014 or 2015. Anyway, it's an older paper, uh, probably 10 years ago maybe, and um, it's by a gentleman by the name of Andre Liu, L-E-U-W. And he goes through all these 
about 20 different chronic diseases and the correlation, and of course, correlation is not causation, but when you have this strong of a cor- correlation in so many diseases um, to the rise in the use of glyphosate, which is antibiotic, um, you know, you, you really have to like pause and think about, um, you know, what you're doing to this internal ecosystem and all the different effects. And there are so many different diseases, but um, autism uh, almost had a perfect correlation yeah. with it. Um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. And that, I wish they would update the paper and show the data now mm-hmm. uh, because it's even more widespread use. So back then when they did the paper, it wasn't used as a desiccant. Um, so that's, it dries down the uh, crops. So if you have a crop that is does not have the glyphosate resistance genes engineered into it like corn and soy, you can use it to dry a crop more uniformly. And there are now, I think close to 20 different crops that use glyphosate in the dry down of the crop. And it goes into the soil. It's been kind of sold as not really, um, you know, that it dissipates out of the environment. But depending on the soil, that's actually not accurate. And in soils, like in Canada, that have uh, heavier clay, it is um, accumulating in the soil over time and what it it was originally used as a chelator of metals and pipes well of course all of these important micronutrients in our body are you know the elements of the earth and um copper being one of those and um glyphosate actually chelates copper at an order of magnitude um I, I forget what the order, I mean, it's a huge order of magnitude higher than the other elements. And it, you can go down the list. Don Huber's research um, shows the chelating factors. It was actually a metals chelator used in pipe cleaning before it came into the food industry. And so, you know, when you start to look at that and how important the elements are to the enzymes working in our body and to the mitochondria, which, you know, you talk about mitochondrial health all the time. Well, the enzymes in the, um, in the mitochondria require copper, a very small amount of copper. But when you're chelating this copper, then those enzymes are, are not fully functioning. Um, and so, you know, as we have more and more and more of that in our environment, we're seeing this, damage to our mitochondrial health and the minerals that it depletes that the mitochondria also need for for energy production glyphosate is everywhere it's, it's estimated that the rainfall has like 60 percent of the rainfall has glyphosate in it just because it's so widespread here and i remember interviewing dr zach bush a few years ago and he was telling me that the average california wine has about 64 different herbicides and pesticides in it uh, and we drink it. it. It's ripping open our intestinal lining, creating this leaky gut where essentially we have undigested food particles, essentially poop floating around in our bloodstream, creating this hyper vigilant autoimmune response, which leads to autoimmune disease and other conditions out there. But it starts with the gut. And, and you mentioned soy is one of the most commonly sprayed crops in the world. Corn, wheat, anything with gluten. And even coffee is up there as well. That's why you want to make sure you get a clean, a clean coffee source. And I know when I walk my dog Ziggy here, and by the way, this is this is cool because Miami, which is where I live, we're here in Miami, was I think the first city in the United States that banned all glyphosate from any public parks. Well, bravo. Yeah, bravo. So no, every park here in Miami that's a public park is not allowed to apply glyphosate, but people who own their different homes and different country clubs and golf courses that's privately owned. So they definitely spray. So when I walk my dog Ziggy here in my neighborhood, which is a beautiful neighborhood, uh, I see my neighbors who have these signs in front, like the pesticide uh, applied here on the lawn. And I stay away from that. Like you don't want, you, you don't want to walk on grass that has pesticides. You don't want your animals to walk on grass that has pesticides. And I always think about golf courses and I, I wonder if there's ever going to be a study done 
on people who spend time on golf courses, which are notoriously sprayed with glyphosate, pesticides, Roundup, and their health outcomes. Have you ever thought about that? I have. I've thought about that a great deal because actually my husband, John, who has Parkinson's. Used to play. Um, he was a caddy. So he was a caddy for I didn't know that. Uh, four years in like high school and college. So he was on the golf course, you know, all all wow. the time. And of course, they're widely used um, on on golf courses. And yeah. um, it's been a it's been something I've looked at a great deal. Um, you know, looking at the application of glyphosate and and. It's just kind of mind-boggling to me that um, there's still not a real deep understanding of, from people of how toxic it is. And, and that, I think that goes to kind of how the story's really been hidden. Um, Stephanie Seneff has a, a – it's maybe not for the total layman, but, you know, she does a pretty good job. I think it's, I think it's called Toxic Legacy. Um, yeah. But, um, you Her know, book. She, she goes into a lot of the mechanisms around that and has done a tremendous amount of research around the mechanisms of action and, and how it works. And um, one of the interesting things, too, is looking at um, glyphosate in the rain and where it's used most frequently and actually wrote a paper, I think, back when COVID first happened on the overlay of the places that had the worst outbreaks of COVID and the use of glyphosate and glyphosate in the environment in those areas. Wow. And, you know, it's antibiotic. Yeah. Um, so, and we need this microbiome to maintain our health. And so, you know, it's active against a lot of, you know, the healthy microbes in our, in our body and, um, it's wild. It's, it is so wild. So we want to eat you know, organic, non-GMO as much as possible, cook your, and prepare, prepare your food as much as possible. Or when all else fails, just move to Italy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm seriously <laughs> considering moving yeah. to Italy. They're actually, they're, they're, Italy was actually the first country this year that also banned fake lab-grown plant-based meat as well. Mm. And Florida also banned it recently too. Uh, we need more cities and states and countries banning these things because they are loaded with not just glyphosate, but, you know, rancid seed oils and all these inflammatory ingredients. Can you share, Martha, a little bit about the connection between the gut and the brain? And tie in a little bit more of John's story, your husband. You, you, you sprinkled a little bit about, you know, him getting Parkinson's, but share this, the connection between the gut and the brain and what happened with John. So... Oh, gosh, that's such a, a big story. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, that's actually what drove me to do everything that I've done. So, you know, my background uh, was in accounting and finance. <laughs> very different. And very different. Although um, I was actually taught a an approach uh, to evaluating a business that was called transaction flow review um, when I went to to work for Arthur Anderson. And in that process, you actually do these big flow charts and you're mapping out everything that flows through the system huh. and you're looking for the breakpoints. And so when John was diagnosed with Parkinson's and, you know, we got sort of the standard spiel, you know, I was like, this is a systems problem. I just kind of intuitively knew that. And so I started, and I intuitively knew that the food had something to do with it, even going back to the, the soy protein shakes. Yeah. And so I started to study the food first. Um, and so over, it's now been 21 years, John is doing much better um, than most people at 21 years. But, um, you know, I started to kind of study it from that systems-based approach, starting with the food and then moving deeply into the science. And um, in 2015, I guess, I read uh, Martin Blazer's book, um, Missing, Missing Mi Microbes. Yeah. And that was just like a big light bulb for me. And um, from that, later that year, the first paper was published on... Uh, Parkinson's and the microbiome. And there's two primary types of Parkinson's. One is affects the posture and the gait more, and one 
is the tremor that most people think of with Parkinson's, but they could actually divide that by gut bacteria. Oh, wow. And that was just this huge epiphany for me. And I, I had invested actually in a animal probiotics company to learn more about probiotics after I read Martin Blazer's research. And, um, I founded the, uh, the bio collective initially to study the human microbiome across the population. So not just in Parkinson's and we started, uh, basically collecting people's poop. So I can't believe it's been nine years, but for the first six years, we collected people's poop. How many uh, different people's poop did you collect? We collected about 1,200 people's poop. Wow, um, it's a lot and, of poop. Yeah, it's a lot of poop, and we made it into these little shitlets. Can I say that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we actually made those available to scientists around the world to do research, and we collaborated with people. But that was probably not the best uh, business model selling shitlets. Um, but along the way, we learned so much about the interconnectedness of the system through the microbiome and that, you know, we think of these single diseases and we study things in this very reductionist way, but it all comes back to this ecosystem and what we're doing to this internal ecosystem. And we could see these patterns across diseases and, so then we started to build a bank of microbes, um, probiotic organisms, and we brought in Dr. Raul Cano as our chief scientific officer who had spent about 30 years at Cal Poly. Um, as, and his, his background was really in um, microbial ecology in a way um, of, of understanding uh, the microbiome long before it even had a, you know, became a catchphrase. And so our, we started to come up with this concept of how can we start to restore that? And along the way, we're sort of mapping out what's going on in Parkinson's and doing research with, um, like providing our samples to top researchers around the world. So we did a project with the University College Cork in Ireland, where uh, John Cryan and Ted Dynan, who are big pioneers in the microbiome space. Um, we did a project uh, with a group of scientists there looking at um, bacteriophages in the microbiome. And we did a project with um, Sarkis Masmanian at um, Caltech um, and have a paper out on that. And then we did a project with a company actually in uh, Poland um, looking for biomarkers in the microbiome and we could start to see you know all these kind of interconnecting factors and um, the exposure to antibiotics and of course antibiotics in the food supply um, is a big part of the shift in this internal ecosystem that's going on with parkinson's and you can start to go back and see patterns in the in the people so we had about a hundred people with parkinson's who participated in our uh, sample collection and we provided those samples all around the world and we could see the patterns of changes and start to come up with these concepts of you know how might we be able to fix those which is actually how I came up with the idea for the first probiotic I made which I wasn't I really wasn't going to make it I wasn't going to be a probiotics company and I wasn't going to you know go down that route, but I, I went to a conference where um, some researchers um, showed uh, what was going on in the microbiome and how um, mannitol uh, could shift the microbiome. And so I came up, I came back and, and we came up with this concept of like putting back a factory in the gut that could produce mannitol um, that would have this impact and, and see if it would help John. And so we just made this little batch of it. I had this friend who had been in the probiotics industry for years, and we made this little batch of it, and we gave it to John, and we were measuring his microbiome as he was going on, and it was getting better and better. And at that time, he was walking with a cane. And within a month, you know, the cane was gone and he was wow. doing much better and, you know, we're measuring, but we could see 
changes in his microbiome, we kept measuring for about nine months, and it was still improving over that nine months. Um, you know, because if you spend a lifetime destroying your microbiome, you're not going to fix it in one month. Um, and so then, you know, after we did that, we I just started like giving it out to people and saying, you know, will you try this? And, you know, I was getting all this feedback. And so actually during COVID, uh, we were collecting poop samples. That was our uh, primary part of building out the bank and doing the research. And uh, when COVID happened, we were wrapping up a, a big grant that we had. And, you know, I'm looking at, okay, well, do I really want to be collecting stool samples with live microbes with, you know, something we don't really know what it is. So yeah. we decided to kind of pivot the whole business and focus on the, the probiotics and the bank of organisms that we had built uh, to do that. And we took, you know, John's probiotic, the sugar shift and, you know, formed uh, BiotiQuest to make the products to, to help that and ultimately went on because we saw in the data from John that it was changing um, sugar metabolism. And of course, it's a lot easier to measure sugar metabolism in a diabetic. And But there is uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's also have research uh, calling them in some cases type 3 diabetes. It's an insulin resistance in the brain. And so um, just that whole process of kind of putting those pieces together, uh, we decided to do a, a study, a clinical study in diabetics. And we actually, um, Dr. Kano is originally from Cuba, and he had developed a relationship with a, a hospital there. And so we actually did our first clinical trial um, in uh, diabetes in Cuba and got some really amazing results about how it shifts the microbiome and changes um, sugar metabolism and affects insulin resistance and um, further down the road actually um, brings down um, A1C. A1C. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I mean, it's if you're following a low carbohydrate keto diet or carnivore diet, this is one of the most important tips. I see a lot of people who struggle with keto and carnivore, and the reason they struggle is because they are losing too many electrolytes. They are becoming mineral depleted. Every cell in your body needs minerals to function, to produce energy, which helps you burn fat and feel good. My favorite minerals and electrolytes are from Beam Minerals. These are fulvic and humic compounds that are bioavailable, that help have over 70 minerals in them. It tastes like water. They're carnivore friendly. Let me explain why. There are no anti-nutrients in them. It does not break a fast. As a matter of fact, it could support your fasting window. And it's been a game changer for my health and I recommend it to all my students. Head over to beanminerals.com. Use the coupon code AZADI at checkout. My last name, A-Z-A-D-I at checkout to get a nice discount. Beanminerals.com, coupon code is AZADI. First question I asked you is how does this tie into metabolic health? That's a perfect example of how it does it. I have a question for you on the testing you were doing for John and just the gut microbiome testing in general, looking at poop fecal samples. What are you measuring exactly to see what's improving? Are you looking at um, diversity? Are you looking at the bifidobacteria, specific bacteria? Are they increasing and, and more harmful bacteria decreasing? Like what exactly are you assessing there? I mean, it, it's... You know, that's one of those complicated questions yeah. <laughs> um, because the microbiome is, is complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and there, you know, there's now really thousands of papers since that first paper from Dr. Shepperhans on Parkinson's and the microbiome. Um, and so we're looking at how, how you're shifting from a pathogenic, uh, profile. So, you know, there's a number of pathogens that produce different metabolites and, you know, how that can affect the brain. And um, we were talking about hydrogen sulfide mm -hmm. um, and methane also. So both hydrogen sulfide and methane producing bacteria are implicated in Parkinson's. 
and um, in some studies. I mean, there, there are a lot of factors that get sort of thrown out in the Parkinson's research depending on, on uh, what they look at. And one of the things that we actually looked at was mycobacteria, so which are resistant to glyphosate um, and can be a driver of long-term metabolic changes in the body by first changing sugar metabolism and then lipid metabolism over time. Um, so it's kind of, it's not a simple answer because it's not a simple ecosystem. Yeah, it's complicated. And, um, but, you know, they're definitely these drivers of antibiotics in our environment that are impacting the gut microbiome. And um, we actually did see um, in one of our early studies a difference in the target gene that glyphosate targets. So kind of back to, you know, the over overuse of glyphosate, and there was a differential expression in the gut microbiomes of healthy people versus wow. people with with Parkinson's. And so what, what, you know, if you had to give a percentage of what we understand about the gut microbiome, what percentage of that, of, of the gut microbiome right now do we understand? Oh, I think a tiny, tiny fraction. I actually have a friend who's in this, the skin microbiome space, Dr. Larry Weiss. And, you know, we talk about this a lot about the hubris of science and thinking, you know, oh, you know, we know all these answers. And of course, even in the beginning, when I saw the microbiome, I was like, oh, you know, this, I, it is the answer. I mean, the answers are there, but it is a complex ecosystem. And so, and many microbes have similar functions. So, you know, you can't just pinpoint it down to, you know, one microbe and one pill and that sort of thing. So we actually took a functional pr approach even to the way we design our um, probiotics. Uh, there was some software that enabled us to build this bioflux model is what we called it. And so you're taking all the way down to the genetics of the organisms that you're putting into the system and how they work together and what they use and produce. And... Um, so we build these working systems to put back into the gut some function that you've lost. Mm. And so our original, with Sugar Shift, we wanted to put back... Um, mannitol. Mannitol production, um, which is... It ended up being like so much more than, than I thought it would be, you know, with the, with the focus on mannitol and the mechanisms of action and... Um, you know, how, how it works. And one of our organisms that actually breaks down glyphosate. So, yeah, it, so sort of back to that because it's an antibiotic and it's selectively right. killing, you know, microbes in the gut that have a lot of function in that shikimate pathway that's producing, you know, these hundreds of important enzymes in the body. What are your thoughts on diversity? Uh, I know that, <clears throat> A lot of these microbiome scientists, the majority, I think, would, would say that, that diversity is important to have different diversity, different microbes in the gut, and the healthy populations are people who have more diversity. But there are people who think uh, there are people who don't necessarily have a diverse gut micro microbiome, and they're super healthy as well. I'm personally still kind of confused here and i know that there's a lot to still be under to understand here with the gut microbiome but i want to hear your thoughts and where you stand right now with diversity well you know i do think diversity is important but it's diversity of function um and there are a lot of microbes with similar functions um so I mean, I think the jury is still out on that, but if you go look at indigenous populations, they do have greater diversity. Um, but there, there's been some actual interesting research that was done on the Hadza mm -hmm. in Africa, and this is an indigenous population that they eat a very strange diet. So, like, part of the year, I want to say, like, blood you know, of the animal is one of their major. So, and then, you know, they're eating plants other parts of the year, but, but they do this kind of swinging back and forth between what 
would probably be considered carnivore. Yeah, extreme carnivore. Extreme carnivore, and then, you know, over into vegetation. And I, I do think that variety, you know, can be important, but I also think um, there really hasn't been, in my opinion, uh, good research on the microbiome and the ketogenic diet. Mm. Um, and if you dig into the research, I mean, I, I worked on a presentation and was looking for some good quality um, ketogenic diet papers. And when you start to dig down into the methods and the details of the papers, it's like, okay, they're using a fat, but it's, it's not what, you know, us real keto people understand as the right kind of fat. Yeah. So they're using a lot of seed oils and, yeah. and that sort of stuff in the, in the research. And of course that's going to also be laden with glyphosate and have impacts as well. So, you know, what I'd really like to see it in, you know, I think you, your little study you did mm-hmm. um, is, um, you know, how you're shifting the microbiome and a ketogenic diet versus, and I, I actually think the problem with our vegetables now is that they, they are what is most laden with the chemicals. And so, you know, are we shifting to a ketogenic diet to protect ourselves from all these chemicals because the animal has already uh, transformed a lot of those chemicals for us. Um, and so through the rumen, where it has a lot more chemistry to break all that down, um, we're more protected by you know, the animal proteins uh, than we are from the plants. And so I, but I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of great research around that. And I do think that the chemicals that are used in our large scale commercial vegetables are a big part of what is damaging our microbiome and also damaging uh, the nutrition of the food because those microbes in the soil are also what helps the plant take up minerals and give us something that's nutritious to eat. And so we've got this decline in the mineral content of, of our vegetables And again, that's going back to glyphosate because it's a metals chelator. So, you know, even in uh, the GMO seeds, uh, you know, the the seed that comes from a GMO plant, the minerals that are in that seed are so locked up that they can't be properly accessed. So, you know, it's a a complex web that has really been messed up. And the key is, you know, the key is the microbes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and with my experiment, right, I, I did carnivore for 90 days. And on day one, um, the test came back saying the recommendations to increase your gut microbiome health is to, you know, increase your fiber, more polyphenol rich foods, more plants, less keto, less red meat. And of course, I did the opposite where I just did nothing but meat for 90 days, pretty keto the whole 90 days. And on day 90, when I retested the gut microbiome, uh, my diversity went up, which is great, but I had seven keystone bacteria show up on day 90 that were not there on day one, and then five core bacteria that showed up on day 90 that were not shown on, on day one without eating a single carb or any fiber, which goes completely against what most, which most people think to increase diversity and increase your gut microbiome. You got to eat fiber, you got to eat plants. Well, for me, in this situation, I did the opposite and my gut improved. So speak on that and then speak on fiber and your thoughts on fiber these days. Oh, you know, wow. That's uh, <laughs> deep. Yeah. It's, you could talk for five hours on that. I know. Well, so there is a fiber that's in meat or, or in the, you know, it's in the organs and in the collagenous tissues and, um, Hyaluronic acid is what you're talking about. Hyaluronic yeah. acid. And, you know, people don't, you don't think of that as a fiber because it's called an acid. And, but, so um, I guess I was having fiber. I, I, so you were, you yeah, were having fiber. From meat. And that is actually, you know, that is a key to all the connective tissue in the body. And, you know, we have a large scale problem in the population with our connective tissue. Yeah. Um, so, and, 
it's a it's a really unique fiber. So, but people don't think about it as a fiber. So you're getting a lot more of that. Although, you know, a lot of people who will do keto don't do it in the. They don't eat organ meat. They don't eat organ meat, sort of and they yeah. don't. Um, so they're not really getting that. So they're fiber. not really getting that at the kind of large scale. Um, you can you get that from organ meat co- um, capsules complexes? You should be able yeah. to. You know, I, I'm always kind of a little bit leery about um, capsules and and the source of that. And I was trying to think. I was actually listening to a replay of a podcast where they were talking about um, having tested uh, these grass fed cows somewhere. Um, and then, like finding that they they really didn't have this the source of I can't remember whether it was collagen or was some of the minerals that they thought they were going to have, um, and you know it was a grass fed population, but of course, kind of back to the glyphosate, it's in the rain, it's, yeah, it's you know everywhere. it's getting everywhere, so it's it's chelating up these critical minerals that are important to you know that collagen structure that kind of holds us all together so vegetable fiber let's clarify that what are your thoughts on vegetable fiber vegetable fiber, plant-based fiber well again but you know back to the plant-based stuff so much of the plant-based foods are heavily contaminated with glyphosate which is antibiotic you know you're you're getting damage to your structures but that's not the structure that so there's a a part of the bot called the endothelial surface layer and the glycocalyx, which is a, a fairly recently focused on phenomenon that is critical to our vasculature and the yeah. delivery of oxygen and and you know other important nutrients through this. Um, you know, it has these little hairs that stand up, and that's, I forgot what the question was. The, the question was about the plant-based fibers. Oh, so, I mean, you're not, fiber. so you're not yeah, getting, you're not getting, you know, you're, you're not getting the, those, uh, what feeds that particular glycocalyx through those kinds of fibers. So fiber um, is overrated is what I'm hearing. Well, in general, just to put it in general terms, would you say plant-based fiber is is kind of overplayed and overrated? I, well, anything when it becomes a product uh, mm-hmm. gets overplayed, um, but that's not what's feeding the um, the glycocalyx. Got it. So, but you know, fiber can be an important part of you know keeping the the bowels moving. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know. I, I do think it is overplayed, and it can, if you don't have a healthy microbiome, it can actually feed the pathogens. Yeah. So that's one of the key things in trying to address your gut health is, you know, understanding how those things may play into your gut health. And um, there's a, a, a Dr. Na- Natasha Campbell McBride. Oh, yeah, um, she's great. Uh, has done a lot uh, to educate people around how to restore your gut health and that important lining of your gut. And, you know, that's through a diet that is bone broth and, you know, you're staying away from fibers and um, those types of things until you actually reheal the lining of your gut, which is your protective barrier. And the antibiotics and all these food additives and things that we're getting is destroying that it. tiny protective layer, you know, that is, you know, roughly a one cell thick. And so, um, you know, if you start eating a lot of fibrous foods, plants, or taking fi- fiber supplements and you don't have a healthy microbiome, you can actually be feeding kind of the wrong kind of gas. And actually, I did at the very beginning of the uh, of the BioCollective... I, did my own little experiment and you know somebody's like eating all you know should eat all these fibers and so I made this fiber shake every morning I put like seven or eight different fibers in it and I drank that every day for about eight months and at the end of I did a I mean did some measurements along the way 
but I, I can't remember the organism I had that was in there, but it, it had increased to 35% of my gut. Was it a, a beneficial organism or? There was very little published research around it. Okay. And I, I can't believe I can't think of the name of it right now. But um, so it increased thirty five percent. So it was thirty five percent of the total population of a oh, gut bacteria. Oh wow! So huge amount, and it you know it was a very diverse organism. I you know so, um, but I was like you know I think I need to do some other work on my gut and like back away from. I mean oh, that's a thirty five percent of your gut. That's yeah, a, that's a high percentage. That's a high percentage. I can't believe I can't think of the name of. It. That's all right. <laughs> but, yeah, the, but the point uh, is, it's made, not though. a common one that people you yeah. know that that people hear of. But and I was testing along the way, and it it had it was already fairly high. I want to say it was like five percent relative abundance in my gut, and you know I was doing these, and it was like going to 10, that's 15, wild. 20, so thirty five percent. And I was like, okay, this this can't be good. You know, I think I need to do some other work first. And um, and it's those microbes can also really feed the the fat storage um, in the in the body as yeah. well. Tying so, back to the metabolic health piece. Tying back to the metabolic health piece. And I went through and um, a, a few years after that actually did um, well, it was when I started uh, with Keto Camp. Um, I went to a retreat and did a, a four day dry fast. Oh yeah, I remember. I, I wish I had done a microbiome test before and after. That would have been that cool to so, to see what happened. So but. you did a dry fast for those who don't know, no water, no food for four days. And I really, it was the toughest part was probably day two, which is where you kind of make that shift, that mm -hmm. metabolic shift over. And I felt great on day four, but I was getting ready to get on an airplane and. I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't keep doing this. Um, Probably a good idea. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to do it again and do it a little bit longer. Um, there's actually a researcher that I followed his uh, book. He's from uh, Caltech. I think he works with the astronauts. And, um, you know, he has this whole dry fasting protocol that you do that, you know, it was pretty fascinating you know, how you prepare for it and what you do. But I kind of kicked that off actually at the beginning of when I started with um, yeah. keto camp and it was very transformative for me. I mean, you can, you can see it probably if you go back and look at the other <laughs> podcast interviews, because the first, actually the first podcast interview I did with you was right after I had had COVID. Yeah, that's right. And I was kind of rough looking. <laughs> Yeah, well, you look completely different. Look so much healthier now. You've lost a ton of weight. And I feel like I, you know, I look younger. I feel younger. And, um, but, you know, I stopped that whole fiber protocol. I had stopped that earlier, but then I really started to shift and look at the food again and look at the food supply and, you know, how that's impacting us and the chemicals in the food supply. And that's, that's what's so troubling about vegetables is they are grown in fruits and vegetables are grown in a in a very intense um pesticide yeah. um laden environment and yeah. so that's that's having it that has a significant impact on our gut bacteria uh, you know that people just don't realize there's this whole population here that is helping us it's our factory that's making all the little components and it breaks down the food. It's delivering nutrients. It's, you know, there's a lot going on at the edges here and um, we need to maintain a healthy microbiome. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting how um, a carnivore diet um, can do that, yeah. um, which is totally counterintuitive. And most of the research that's out there is really not good research in, yeah. in that on keto uh, and the gut yeah. on that particular field and how they classify things as yeah uh, yeah and if you read keto. the headline you would think that keto would not be good right. for your gut and they're using seed oils correct and, it's and not the like way that, we so. teach and do keto so it's very very different uh, i want to close with a couple of things here um you talk about probiotics we have your a couple of your products here that i use and as you know the keto camp academy students use it as well uh, Sugar Shift is the one I have here in my hand for those watching on YouTube and the Simple Slumber. You have several others out there. Could you just share a little bit more about these products and what's the difference between your BiotiQuest products here and other probiotics out there? And before you even get to that, I've been taking these products for over a year now, I think maybe in close to two years. 
And a lot of our students, Keto Camp Academy students use it. You got the study on uh, the a re reducing A1C, uh, the clinical study did in Cuba. You also have uh, the antibiotic, uh, uh, antibiotic antidote product as well to re repopulate what the antibiotic does to destroy the bad bacteria. And uh, Martha is going to speak a little bit more about this, but if you go to bioticquest.com, which is B-I-O-T-I quest.com, and uh, you can look at the products, and if you use the coupon code KETOK15, you could get 15% off your entire order. We're going to put that link in the coupon code below the YouTube video and below the podcast. But Martha, share a little bit more about these products and what's the difference between your products and other probiotics out there? So... Actually, the, the Sugar Shift probiotic is that probiotic that I initially made for, for John. For right. John yeah. And um, that we found does so much more than, you know, what we ever imagined. Um, but from that product, actually, Dr. Raul Cano, who's our chief scientific officer, kind of helped us in the development uh, along with Nasir Sangawan, um, who now is at the Cleveland Clinic, who helped us develop this computational model that allows us to predict how all the microbes work together as a team because, you know, we're in in life we're better when we work together and the microbes are better when they work together. And most probiotics on the market come from just a handful of suppliers, and we do use one of those suppliers for some of our strains. Um, but there's really not a lot of diversity in the microbes. And we build ours as working teams to put a function back into the gut. And so that sugar shift formula, um, you know, we call it that because it changes sugar metabolism in the body. And it's basically converting glucose and fructose into mannitol, which we don't use. And so it's eliminated through, you know, our urine and feces. And so, and it has a lot of other impacts along the way uh, when it does that, that, you know, I guess at first were surprising to us, but the more we've studied it, the less surprising it is. So, you know, we've, we've lost some of these. What's, what's interesting. So we have, um, you know, one of our key players in all of our uh, formulas is a lactobacillus plantarum that I actually um, collected <laughs> from elderberries in my neighborhood. And of course we know our neighborhoods are exposed to glyphosate and most of the lactobacillus are actually killed by glyphosate. Mm. And we found this lactobacillus plantarum that was resistant to glyphosate and it had a unique pathway that wasn't that well known called the third pathway of glyphosate degradation that actually, you know, breaks it all the way down. And one of the things that it produces is glycine, which is a very important amino acid. Interesting. And so that really is, I'll say, you know, we have keystone species in our gut. That is our keystone probiotic that, you know, we talk to most people about. It helps people kick the sugar habit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also why in keto camp, you know, as people are trying to make that conversion. Yeah, to get fat um, adapted, it really to helps. To get fat adapted, it, it does help with that, and it shifts the microbiome, which in our uh, diabetes clinical trial, we can see how it's shifting the microbiome and, and you know, what it's doing there. And how, how, uh, In your diabetes trial, what was the dosage? What did they take? How much? They took one capsule in the morning and one capsule in the evening. I do have people who take more than that, and I have people who take less than that because they are sensitive mm -hmm. um, to the detoxification process. With uh, or without food? Does it um, matter? I think it's better with food because so many of the food, so much of the food um, has glyphosate in it, even if you're trying to be healthy. And it, it does break down glyphosate. So um, that Great. is that Easy. is really our key player and the one that I sugar made shift. for John and um, you know was in that diabetes clinical trial um, that has had great results. And hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. A sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. 
Also, it's going to cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release. Every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60 minute massage. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. Head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code. All right, let's get back to today's video. You know, everybody's different. It takes longer for some, some people they'll say, oh, you know, I noticed a difference in like two days. Other people, you know, it's a month, two months. I mean, it's usually the way it goes. Um, you know, it's it, but the microbiome keeps remodeling over time. And so that's a great tool for that. The simple slumber, um, product actually that helps with, um, bacterial melatonin. Um, so it's helping you produce melatonin and it works for about seven, eight hours. Um, it actually, you'll get a, a more solid, uh, deeper sleep, uh, with that. Um, I got to experiment more with this simple slumber. I'm looking at it here because, you know, I track my sleep and I do different things to see. Uh, I'm going to do some tests with this. This is a really cool one. So it helps your body produce melatonin endogenously is what I'm hearing. Yeah, melatonin and serotonin. Does it matter when you take this? What time of day? I mean, you take it about an hour before bedtime. It works for about seven to eight hours. So throughout the whole time, you're, I see it here, one capsule before bedtime. The one I like as well is the antibiotic antidote for somebody who either has gone through a round of antibiotics or you're, you know, you've, you're eating foods that have antibiotics in it. Great product. So I actually, when we started to develop these formulas, I mean, we have a suite using our computational model that's called Bioflux of about 20 different products, um, which, you know, every time you bring a product, I mean, we are a tiny company, so bringing new products to the market is expensive. So we have some others kind of slated to come along, but, um, you know, that, that whole process of making that suite of products, we had antibiotic antidote kind of sitting on the shelf. And um, Steve Cosme, who's one of my advisors, he's actually um, somebody that I learned about the probiotics industry from I invested in his animal probiotics company at the very beginning when yeah, I, you had I wanted that. to learn and um he called me so his mother who was in her 80s um had to have uh so she had appendicitis and they removed her appendix and put her on IV antibiotics and she was just feeling awful and I mean she's a very vital 80 80 something year old woman and um, he had been talking to her about probiotics for years because he's been in the industry and she didn't pay any attention to him. And so she was just feeling terrible after being on a month's worth of IB antibiotics. Wow. And he's like, you know, you've got that antibiotic antidote. Like, could you make that? And so we made a very small batch of it and she tried it. And I mean, she wrote me the nicest note and then called me up on the phone and it had just made such a huge difference for her. So I was like, okay, let's, you know, let's make the antibiotic antidote. And, um, you know, I've had phone calls from many people, um, about that product. And it, it's interesting because there was, uh, there was some research from a university in Israel on a different probiotic and taking that after, um, antibiotics and it actually made things worse and I got with Raul and we looked at kind of what the bacteria were in that and they were all high acid producers and again back to our little system that we use our software you know we're balancing pH and the the different molecules that the microbes use and produce and we're building a team and so the design of the antibiotic antidote was to build a team that would balance the pH to allow the restoration of a more ro robust microbiome. Makes sense. And so, you know, we've had uh, a lot of people with good results uh, with that of restoring the microbiome. I love it. Anytime one of my clients gets on a round of antibiotics, sometimes it is necessary. I immediately tell them to buy a bottle of the antibiotic antidote. So you can check out all the products, biotoquest.com and then keto K15 uh, I, I check out for a nice discount. I want to talk, I want to ask you the last question here. 
about another supplement that you know very well of, which is vitamin G, <laughs> and uh, which is gratitude, the amazing healing benefits of feeling and experiencing gratitude, Martha. First of all, I'm grateful for you, and I learn so much from you all the time. You're, you're of course, a dear friend and colleague. We're also in the Keto Camp Academy, uh, so you're technically a student of mine as well. But you join our group coaching calls very often, and you're just dropping like knowledge bombs after knowledge bombs, and we learn so much from you. And your dedication to John, your husband John, is admirable. Your dedication to the gut microbiome research and just constantly learning and teaching me and my audience so much. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I love your commitment so much so that you flew here from Kentucky to record with me. Um, and I'll be in your neck of the woods at Kentucky for the um, Keto Palooza in Kentucky. But I'm very grateful for you and your work and your friendship. And I want to ask you what you have vitamin G for today. Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, I have, well, I have vitamin G for you because um, it's been a great uh, journey with you and the Keto Camp and the the people in Keto Camp. I am so grateful to, well, to John um, for, he has the hardest part of the journey by being the person who's sick and all of his difficulty sorry, <laughs> that has led me down this path to be able to help more people. And it's, you know, it's not easy for him, um, but he has taught me so much. So I'm so grateful to him uh, for being my partner in the journey and for also trying a lot of the crazy things that I have um, <laughs> tried with him, including at some point down the road, we, we've been talking to a doctor in California about a fecal transplant. Yes, um, yes. But I'm also really grateful to the many scientists around the world who have embraced me and my out-of-the-box thinking and have collaborated and worked with me to teach me their knowledge and to learn from me. And that has been um, just a, and continues to be a wonderful experience for me. And then I'm grateful to God because he watches over me and he's brought all these great people like you into my life to help me help John. Yeah. Amen to that, Martha. Amen. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful story. If you enjoyed that conversation, check out the recent interview I did with Dr. Berg, all about eating the right foods on keto and carnivore, how to burn fat and feel good. Sometimes people think that ketones are a secondary source of fuel and the primary is glucose. But if that was the case, where was this glucose available long ago when our bodies were developing? It's uh, so...